distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I join and embrace the protocol established by our chair and principal earlier. It is a distinct honor for me to stand and introduce a friend, a colleague, a mother, a grandmother, and an international scholar in the name of none other than Professor Lorraine D. Cook. This afternoon we have gathered to share in the occasion of this inaugural lecture, celebrating our advancement to the rank of professor at the UWI Mono. This achievement is no simple or easy feat. And she would tell you in her own words that it is God's grace that has made this possible. Professor Cook, through this achievement, you continue to shine light on the School of Education and serve as a model of inspiration for younger academics. And so I use this opportunity at this time to salute you. I should also point out before I go any further that I've really tried hard to summarize the vast and varied achievements of Professor Cook. So in order to keep the introduction concise, I have presented, I'm trying to present a summary. And so if there is anyone at all who wants a little bit more detail on anything, this may be a good conversation starter during the cocktail segment. So here goes a glimpse into the world of Professor Cook. Professor Cook holds a PhD in educational psychology with high commendation, master's in educational psychology with distinction, a diploma in education specializing in social studies and geography, a bachelor of arts with specialization in urban studies, and a range of certified training in areas such as research ethics, statistical methods, and software for data analysis, among others. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, these qualifications suggest that Professor Cook is a lifelong learner. Professor Cook joined the Department of Education, now the School of Education in 2006. Since joining the School of Education, she has served and continues to serve in several capacities to advance the agenda of the School of Education and by extension, the wider UWI. Her work in the School of Education includes teaching various courses at the undergraduate and graduate levels in the area of psychology and research, successfully supervising the research projects for masters and doctoral students. In fact, one of her doctoral students was awarded with high commendation at our most recent graduation held in November. Professor Cook also served as acting director of the School of Education, acting option coordinator for the geography and social studies option, and assistant coordinator for the graduate studies unit in the School of Education. She continues to give invaluable service through several committees. And you would have heard this afternoon about her work on the committee for ethics. But I want to repeat it to say that Professor Cook has undertaken several initiatives regarding ethics, not just for the faculty, but across the university campus, across other campuses of the MONA. And she has also undertaken during the COVID period to lead a number of research initiatives to support students completing the ethics review process. And so we thank you for that magnificent and invaluable work. We do not take it for granted. While leading the Ethics Committee for the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Professor Cook also continues to share in other teamwork. One of the groups in which she shares is the Education for Sustainable Development Working Group in the, in the School of Education. From time to time, Professor Cook 
has been called upon, as you would have heard from our director, to lead several ad hoc committees, and she does this without hesitation. Furthermore, Professor Cook shows her commitment and dedication to advancing the agenda of the department, the faculty, the campus, and the wider UWI through organizing and hosting several capacity building workshops, seminars, and conferences that benefit both staff and students. Being a stellar academic, Professor Cook has extended her work beyond the walls of the UWI to contribute to Jamaica's agenda for social transformation. And to this end, she has collaborated with Pastor Bruce Fletcher on a major project known as Operation Save Jamaica. The project focuses on changing the landscape of education in under-resourced schools and communities. Through this partnership, she has engaged several international scholars and private sector organizations to provide training for those who work and lead in these schools. Professor Cook remains a board member of Operation Save Jamaica, and this work is quite dear to her heart. Professor Cook has also worked as a consultant on projects with UNICEF, the Ministry of Education, and the Broadcasting Commission. She's an academic advisor for Operation Restoration Christian School, an external examiner for the Faculty of Humanities, for the Faculty of Education and Liberal Studies at the University of Technology, Jamaica. And she supports high schools in hosting various professional development sessions. As an international scholar, Professor Cook's research has created impact on the international stage, resulting in her collaboration with leading international scholars such as John Creswell, Francis Sage, Tony Owen Buzo, Gloria Ladson Billings, and if you do a Google search, these are really some big names. Professor Annette Cook, Annette Henry, to name a few. During her Fulbright scholarship period at New York University, she collaborated with the developer of the Insights into Children's Temperament program, Professor Sandy McClory, to offer the program in Jamaica. And you would have heard the Early Childhood Commission representative talking about that earlier. She served, therefore, as the first manager and trainer of this project, and this project attracted over $30 million through the Chase Fund to support the implementation of the program through school-wide training. One of the many outputs of this project is a course called Temperament-Based Classroom Management in Early Childhood Development, a course that continues to be offered in the School of Education and is quite popular amongst our teachers. She continues to work with the Insights program with other colleagues locally, regionally, and internationally. Another area of Professor Cook's work that has created international impact is her work in the area of mixed methods research, and you would have heard about that earlier. Since introducing mixed methods research to the School of Education, she has collaborated with colleagues from the international chapter to launch the Caribbean chapter of Mixed Methods International, where she served as the founding president, and we would have heard about the journal earlier. Professor Cook has also developed a Mixed Methods course, which is quite another course quite popular amongst graduate students, as well as two massive online courses for the Mixed Methods International chapter. And I really want to pause here to use the opportunity to congratulate Professor Cook on her most recent appointment as president-elect of the Mixed Methods Research International Association. <laughs> Professor Cook's work has also won her several awards and recognition. She has been the recipient of the Principal's Research Award for Best Publication and for the research project attracting the most research funds in the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Her doctoral dissertation also received the award of Most Outstanding PhD Thesis for the 
2007 academic year at the Uemona campus and the Dean's Award for Excellence in 2007. In 2011, she was awarded the Fulbright Visiting, Visiting Researcher Award, which allowed her to serve as a visiting scholar in applied psychology at the New York University. And in 2018, she was a visiting associate professor at the University of British Columbia. Distinguished colleagues, friends, family, students, Professor Cook is a stellar researcher who has amassed over 40 refereed publications. And this continues to grow as we look forward to sharing with her that book that she has been working on, looking at managing aggressive behavior in students. So we look forward to listening and learning more from Professor Cook as she continues this research journey. But I want to say with us, say to us this afternoon that Professor Cook is not only just about research and publication. And yes, she's humble, so she's getting a little bit uncomfortable with all of what I'm saying. But this evening is about Professor Cook. And so there are two more things that I want to share quickly. Professor Cook is the epitome of what it means to value family and friendship. And we would have heard our chair spoke about that earlier. While doing this amazing work, she remains very present for her family and friends, and they also remain a strong support for her. Professor Cook has three sons, a grandson who she absolutely adores, a loving sister, a husband who adores her, and who she adores as well. The second thing I want to share is that Professor Cook is a Christian, who believes firmly in the faithfulness of God. She undergirds her actions with prayer to the point where sometimes you may be talking with her about a matter that is of concern to her and in mid-sentence she would segue to say, you know what, I'm going to pray about this because right now I want to make sure I'm doing what is right. She's always concerned about doing the right thing by everyone. Her Christian principles are therefore borne out in her acts of kindness and love towards everyone she encounters. Here are some ways in which friends, students, and colleagues have described her. Approachable, hardworking, dependable, loyal, efficient, caring, helpful in resolving personal issues, and someone who goes above and beyond to help our students. Colleagues, I therefore close this introduction with a statement from someone who has been a beneficiary of the love that exudes from Professor Cook, as I think this statement aptly captures what the rest of us think. And I quote, my journey of work and friendship with Lorraine Cook these last few years has indeed made me a better academic and person because I have borne witness to her heart, a heart that exudes the dedication and hard work of an exemplary academic, leader, innovator, mover, and shaker, and builder. What is more is that Lorraine shares that heart with everyone she encounters that heart of inclusion and acknowledgement, that heart that speaks truth yet embraces and uplifts, that heart that nurtures and commits as it strives for the other to flourish and succeed. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the podium a well-respected, phenomenal colleague, friend, academic, and as was said earlier, one who is little but talawa.
Alison Nicholson, chairperson, Professor and friend and colleague, Professor Dale Weber, pro-vice-chancellor and principal of the UWI Mona Campus, Professor Sylvia Quimberg, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, the UWI Mona Campus, Dr. Marcia Rainford, Director of the School of Education, UWI Mona Campus, Mrs. Michelle Campbell, Director of the Department of Cross-Sectoral Coordination, the Early Childhood Commission, Dr. Carmel Ruth Bowen, Deputy Dean of Graduate Studies, Matters, Dr. Therese Ferguson, Mori, and Deputy Dean of Undergraduate Matters, Mrs. Nadine Bucklon, Manager of General Manager of UB Press, and I could go on and on. Ladies, gentlemen, friends, family, colleagues, welcome. Good evening. And I, I just want to acknowledge Professor Errol Miller. Thank you for being here, Professor Zaylin. Jennings, always a support, um, and Professor Weber, you're always a support. <laughs> I want to just acknowledge you, and I, and I just want to acknowledge my Lord and Savior. I thank God for his mercies and grace during COVID-19. I thank him for sparing our lives and allowing our country to suffer no more from this dreaded disease. And so many of us have experienced loss of loved ones during this time. May Christ's comfort and grace continue to be yours. Let me acknowledge my family, colleagues, and friends online, and also thanks to Cathy and Ilan. Okay, so. I, am, I know that the evening is long spent. I really know that, and I thank you for your patience. I'm going to try as much as possible to see how I can cut down on this. All right, so, um, so, so I, I just want you to bear with me as I acknowledge my husband, David Cook. We have been married for 38 years. You have been a rock and an inspiration. And thank you. I also want to acknowledge my sons, Christopher, Jonathan, and Luke, and my only sister, Carol. Thank you for being here, for your support and your love. My oldest son, Christopher, could not be here physically, but I'd like to acknowledge his family, Sarah, and of course, my grandson, Ezra. And let me just quickly go through. That's my, those are my parents. They passed away this year. Um, my stepfather passed away April the 7th. My mother passed away April the 30th. But my mother was my anchor, my protector, my best friend, and my heart still aches, but I'm forever thankful that Mrs. Listine Palmer was my mother, and the memories will never, ever fade. And I just want to also remember my stepfather. He was the only father I knew for 55 years. And of course, Professor Colin Palmer, this university had honored him. He's the brother, for those who are wondering the connection, you know, know it, he's the brother of my stepfather. And so the memories of his kindness will never fade. I would like to also acknowledge Mrs. Abba Paulson. It was Abba that set me on this journey I was, an, I was a housewife for eight years, and I wanted a new beginning. I was restless, and Abba encouraged me to, to become an educator. She was the one that encouraged me to apply for the diploma in education. I applied, and I got through. Here I am. So this is the beginning of my journey. Abba has passed on a, a couple years ago, and I really want to just pray that God continue to comfort her husband and her sister and her family. But I know Abba is at rest with her Savior. Bear with me. I just want to, I, I really want to thank God for my, no, 
Right. I really want to thank God for my doctoral supervisor at the University of the West Indies, my very resourceful mentor. I think he's online. He is my VRM. He is my visioner and academic igniter, Dr. Tony Bastic. Dr. Bastic and I researched and published several articles in peer-reviewed journals. Thanks to his wife, Professor Beatrice Buffo Bastic. I got that right. She has been a support. I'd like to just quickly acknowledge several persons. Dr. Barbara Matalon, who is not here. She was supportive when Dr. Bastic was overseas for an academic year. During my doctoral studies, I worked as a research assistant for Professor Errol Miller and Professor Zeline jennings Craig. I'd like to thank you both for your support and your training. I, I, you know, when I told my mother that I got professorship, she was bedridden, and I went and I told her, and she said, I didn't waste my money after all. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you didn't waste your time. Professors, at the end of my doctoral studies, Dr. Susan Anderson started my journey in, this, in being a staff of School of Education. She, um, she was going on sabbatical and she asked me to work for her. Dr. Anderson, thank you for your support during my academic career. You were like a mother. You have the spirit of care upon you. From the, from, from the academic year 2007, I received a full-time employment as a lecturer, and I won't give him my bio. No, I won't. And I was going to go through um, three features of my, but it has already gone, they, you know, many, many persons have already mentioned these features, so I won't belabor them anymore. Just sufficient to say that Chase Funds have um, ended in 2018 for Insights in Jamaica, and Dr. Charlene Cole and I continue to implement the program on a small scale. And just to acknowledge um, the mixed methods, we now have five, we, ha we are on our fifth president, and the president is from Trinidad and Tobago. I just want to acknowledge also that Trinidad and Tobago heavily involved in mixed methods, and this was led by Dr. Vimala Kamaladeen, who passed away this year. Um, my heart still aches. Passed away this year, July the 5th. And also Barbados, and this was led by Dr. Claudette Fongkong Mongal. And, um, so I also want to acknowledge Professor Tony Owebuze in the international community. He was instrumental in mixed methods taking root in the Caribbean, along with Professor Bert Johnson, Professor John Hitchcock, and Professor Natalia Ivankova. I want to acknowledge, um, you heard his name over and over again, um, Pastor Bruce Fletcher for working along with me in on the resource communities and Mrs. Lorna Stanley. Is Lorna here? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, and now the lecture. Oh, that, was good. that was good. So the theme of this lecture is differences in the classroom deeper than what you see or think. I will try as much as possible to be short. All right. <laughs> These differences are psychological, involves, involving teachers' beliefs and their understanding of children's temperament, and pedagogical, involving how teachers deliver the curriculum in the classroom. The guiding questions for this lecture are, one, why are psychological differences important in understanding classroom interactions? Two, how do teachers differ in their teaching practices using the psychological construct, teachers' locus of control? And teachers' locus of control is really the extent to which teachers, teachers take responsibility for outcomes in the classroom. And third, how do teachers view uh, classroom management, views on classroom management change in light of their understanding of differences in children's temperament? So to give a background, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Jamaican context 
which is going to give us a background to the lecture and also provides urgency to the questions that we are examining today. Outside of the classroom, there's a rising culture of violence. Between January 1 and November the 5th, 2022, we had a total of 1,329 individuals murdered. In November, on November the 16th, 2022, the Prime Minister of Jamaica declared a state of emergency in several parishes due to what? Gang violence. Combined with the social problem I just mentioned, our schools are all at all levels of the education system have poor student outcomes academically and in terms of students' behavior. Despite providing universal access to primary education, our primary school children's learning outcome remains unsatisfactory. The 2021 Patterson's, Patterson's report supports the comment that the primary school children learning outcomes are unacceptable. Patterson noted, although Jamaica has a, a good record of giving, providing universal access to primary school, the results in 2019 indicated that at the end of six years, of primary schooling, 59% were failing mathematics and 45% were failing in language arts. At the secondary level, Patterson also noted that a large percentage of our students in the, at the high school level were leaving high school without a certificate. For example, he noted that for the 18-year-old group in 2018, only 30% left secondary school with a cert certificate. I am not addressing gender issue in this lecture, but it is such a critical issue that I must mention gender. So again, Professor Patterson's report, please note the following. He says there is a gender problem and the boys are at a disadvantage. The boys are directly, this disadvantage of the boys are directly related to the crisis of unattached youth, gangs, and violence. He, he, he goes on to mention that boys are living in situations where they have abusive upbringing. They are exposed to cultural norms that are disin disincentivizes education. Let's go back about 30 years. Professor Errol Miller, statement in Men at Risk. You remember that book, Professor Errol Miller? 1991. Two thirds of the children, and I'm quoting from him, two thirds of the children with these health Poor health and nutritional records were who? Boys. Poverty was po manifesting itself more adversely in the case of boys than girls. With consequences of what? School performance. Poor school performance. So after 30 years. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. So after 30 years, edu the educational situation has not substantially changed, including the outcomes of boys mentioned in Professor Patterson's report in 2021. Before looking inside the Jamaican classroom, we must acknowledge that there are three different types of school. Those accessed by the middle and upper class and those schools that are accessed by working class. We know there is a difference between the two in spite of universal education policies. The following questions are not questions I'll answer in this lecture. However, the examination of our educational context raises the following questions which give urgency to today's lecture. 
When we graduate young people from high school who are not literate, who are not capable of working, where do they go? What do they do? What is happening, the second question, what is happening in the classrooms, not only to the students, but to our teachers? Third, could our crime rate and senseless killing be connected to the issues in the previous questions? What if we had wandered into a Jamaican classroom 20 years ago? What might we have found there? I turn to Professor Isons Evans' book, published in 2001, Inside the Jamaican Classroom. Professor Evans noted, the quality of instruction causes low achieving students to experience little, if any, success in school. This erodes any self-esteem they may have. She goes on, incorrect work and other incidences that annoy the teacher were also seen to bring on the wrath of teachers often resulting in verbal abuse. A boy complained, and I'll try to translate. She said that we are not learning anything. The teacher said to me, we are not learning anything. We are going to end up planting ganja and turning dreadlocks. The girl complains. She calls us fool. She makes me feel shame. She makes me feel lesser than. Patterson noted that the quality of care and training are unsatisfactory in the, in, the, in the schools. As educators, we seem to be failing our students. The Jamaican educational problem are multifaceted and requires a multidisciplinary solution. This lecture will only address one aspect of this multifaceted issue. This evening, we will explore teacher personality and understanding of how teacher personality will give insights into the Jamaican classroom and possibly help to challenge personality, the personality disposition of the Jamaican teacher who is so central to the development of our students, both academically and as functional citizens. As educators, we need to understand how our psychological differences influence how we manage ourselves, the students, and the delivery of the curriculum. In other words, our psychology will shape our pedagogy. And through understanding children's temperament, we will be better able to nurture children through positive behavioral management strategies. We have a professional and moral responsibility as teacher educators to close the gap or remediate the situation in the education system. It seems that our quality of education and students' outcome have not changed much for 30 years. We need to figure out what our next steps are. And so, the guiding questions, just to remind you of the guiding questions. Am I there? No, I'm not there. Okay, just to remind you of the guiding questions, and I will start with question one. Why are psychological differences important in understanding classroom interactions? Understanding psychological differences help to create a rich, positive learning environment for students and teachers. It creates an environment in which the students are acknowledged and respected as individuals and feel understood and supported by their teachers. Research such as that by Kola et, um, et al. 
reported on narratives from 267 undergraduate students that indicated the attributes of their most memorable teachers during high school. And I'm certain you're thinking about the attributes of your most memorable teacher right now. Those attributes are the teacher's instructional skills as well as interpersonal skills. So in helping teachers understand students' differences, it is important to enable teachers to understand how they differ as individuals psychologically. There's evidence in the literature that teachers' beliefs are closely connected to their values, their views of the world, and their conception of their place within it. Beliefs determine how people organize and define tasks and problems, and can be predictors of how teachers behave in the classroom. So looking at psychological differences in the classroom falls in the ambit of differential psychology. And I will try to skim over this section in the interest of time. It is a given that no two human beings are born the same. Influences on our development as humans originate with heredity, inborn genetic endowment from a person's biological parents. Or other influences come from the external environment, the world outside of the self. No two people are exactly alike, but no two people are completely different. Sometimes when educators focus too much on the similarities, they somehow forget the differences and fall into the old habit of applying a one-size-fits-all mentality and practices to the classroom. Um, I did, right, I wanted to explain, um, okay, let me just quickly do it. Um, differential psychology tend to consider research in the following domains. The affective, how we feel our emotions, the cognition comprises our thinking, our beliefs, how we make meaning from the world that we interact with. D, the desires, the motivation, the tendencies that drives us, our short-term memory, our long-term goals. Behavior comprises our actions, and uh, such as walking, talking, as well as our physiological processes, such as uh, heartbeat. These four domains are not linear to each other, but are integrated and manifested in our action. Someone who is acting rational will process and decide on their action using these domains. It is important to point out that there are behaviors where people have not gone through these processes. They just act without thinking, without processing their feelings. An individual who is not in a combative mode is likely to think through their response and likely to use these domains before action and behavior. There are three levels of information processing that I quickly want to just point out, and they are reactive, routine, reactive, routine, and reflective. Reactive, it is important to note that the reactive, routine, and reflective levels are not separated by sharp boundaries, but lie on a continuum of complexity ranging from the most ba basic and immediate, reactive, to well-learned and rehearse rehearsal processes, routine, to complex and abstract processes. So the reactive processes is really the physiological response. The routine comprises well-learned everyday activities. The reflective level now describes high level of cognitive functioning, such as self-awareness and metaprocessing, right? So what is metaprocessing? An example, metacognition. I can't fuse it again, right? 
Metacognition is thinking about your own thinking, assessing your own thinking, right? At this level, the affect becomes, that's the affective, the emotions, become enriched with cognitive content such, as, such that the conscious plans may guide behavior towards or away from well-elaborated and nuanced goals. Reflective thinking frees us from mere impulsive and routine activity, such as verbally abusing children. It enables us to act deliberately and intentionally to achieve the action and effect we want. Dare I say, we need. It is not reflecting after action, but reflecting before actions and even in midstream. This is the level that teacher education should aim for when we are training our teachers. Okay, I'm going to skip. Okay, so why is it important to know all of this? It is essential that teachers in the classroom become aware of their emotions, their thoughts, their motivations, and their actions. Ideally, this should be happening in a way that is intentional and responsive, rather than simply instinctive. Then you're in trouble. So now let us talk a little about teacher's locus of control. So this is the second question. So we have one more to go. How do teachers differ in their teacher's locus of control using psychological construct, teacher's locus, locus of control? And so I am just going to, locus of control is a psychological construct that addresses how individuals' behavior, inf, uh, beliefs influence behavior. This construct was developed by Julian Rotter in 1950s and it's widely studied. Rotter noted that his article set a tidal wave of research. He likened the response to, the, to lighting a cigarette and seeing a forest fire. This tidal wave continues to this present day with more than 500,000 hits. So why I'm saying all of this is that the construct is well researched and the two categories of persons are confirmed over and over again. Okay, so just quickly. So um, let me just move on quickly again. And I'm trying to move quickly. Okay. All right. So locus of control is underpinned by social learning theory. And what is social learning theory? Social learning theory is that personality represents the interaction between individuals and their, inter their environment. To understand behavior, one must look at individuals' history of learning and experiences and their environment. That is the stimuli that individuals are aware of and respond to. This, these must all be taken into account when trying to understand others and oneself. Even though Rotter sees personality as relatively stable over time, he does not believe that personality is, is set and cannot change. He states the change, change the way the person thinks or change the environment the person is responding to and the behavior will change. If the behavior changes, then the individual personality can change. However, according to Rotter, the more one gains personal and professional experiences with life, the more one reinforces a particular set of beliefs. So we at teacher education, we have to turn that around. This understanding about Rotter that personality is not fixed provides a theoretical undergrounding for an interventionist approach to modifying teachers' locus of control. The idea should be, this idea should be encouraging to us as educators. It is possible to change, it is possible for change to occur based on new understanding and change beliefs. 
So I work with teachers' locus of control, not the general. Behavior, and this is why I do, behavior is not influenced only by personal traits, but also by the particular context within which the behavior happens. A person's thoughts, emotions, and behavior depend on the state of the person and at the same time on the environment, although their relative importance varies from individuals to individuals. I'm going to quickly skip over this slide. Okay, yep. So this evening, I will be using three of my published articles to give some insights into the Jamaican classroom using TLOC. The first article was published in 2012, Teachers' Locus of Control Identifying Differences in the Classroom. The third article, which is really a book chapter, was published in 2011, The Impact of Teachers' Locus of Control on Students' Perception of Teachers Within Selected Urban Areas in Jamaica. And the third article, published in 2019, Teachers' Locus of Control, Tests, Characteristics, and New Direction. For the first article, Teacher's Locus of Control, Identifying Differences in the Classroom, I used a mixed methods re research approach, and mixed methods is combining quantitative and qualitative approaches into investigating a research problem. Here, I adapted the Teacher's Locus of Control scale developed by Rose and Midway. We use this scale to categorize teachers into those with external LOC and those teachers with internal LOC. So the external are those teachers who take responsibility for learning outcomes and behavioral outcomes in the classroom. They believe that they can effect change. The external teacher does not take responsibility. They believe that change will come, come, come into being based on what the parents are doing at home, or fate or luck. These categorization of teachers were followed by a qualitative exploration of internal and external teachers' teaching practices. The sample consisted of 175 females and 50 males with a mean average of 32 years. There, this sample of teachers had an average of nine years teaching experience. So the mean TLOC score for these participants was negative 7.93. Let me quickly point out that the negative sign shows direction, not value. So overall, the teachers for this sample were external in their locus of, teacher's locus of control. I then generated a box plot to identify those teachers who were outliers in their TLOC mean score, teacher's locus of control, and those who were typical in each category. And then I did observations and interviews. And there are several emerging themes, and I won't bore you with all of them. I'm just going to report on two. So the first, the use of feedback. Feedback was defined from the teacher's perspective, that is, teacher's use of nonverbal reactions and performance as, guided, as a guide for delivery of the lessons and their teaching approach. Teacher's awareness of verbal and nonverbal communication during the teaching of their lesson. I know the results. Teachers with internal locus of control during observation had a tendency to move around the classroom to teach and to observe how their students were responding to the lessons. For example, Question, no, sorry. After a few minutes, she started questioning the class concerning what she had taught up to that point in time. 
As an observer, I heard the revision of the lesson taking place in the class, but I was not certain what made her stop by that specific student. During the interviews, I asked about the above situation, and she explained that while moving around the class, she noticed a student was knitting her brows and had a questioning look on her face. She stopped and asked the student if she was following the lesson. The student indicated that she had followed to a point but was still confused about the general principle that the teacher thought the class had understood. Hence, the revision. So internal teacher, 39, explained her thoughts of, behind her actions. And just quickly, I won't be reading everything. Sometimes, she said, there are children who are afraid of their own voices. But you would see interest in their facial expression, through their bulging eyes, and so on. And she went on to talk about lunchtime. During lunchtime break, children become restless. And she's very sensitive to this. And so she said, so what you do as a teacher, you give them enough work that will keep them. You must not frustrate them. Please remember the internal teacher. During the teaching session, internal teachers, that is, teachers with internal TLOC, had a tendency not to limit their use of feedback to students' verbal communication. But they seemed to observe and use students' body language to inform their practices. Teachers with internal TLOC asked questions during the teaching and learning process to clear up misconceptions and to ensure that the students understood as the lesson progressed. So for example, teacher 41. Internals also seem to give feedback to students not only about the content of their academic work, but also to influence and build students' self-confidence. When asked, why is immediate feedback so important? Teacher 26 indicated, and I'll just read just a small amount, that that class has a serious problem with self-confidence, motivation. They seem to have a low self-esteem even towards the subject. By giving that immediate feedback, it helps to build their self-esteem, and they feel that they're in fact learning. The external teachers now, those are the teachers who do not believe that their actions in the classroom can make a difference, in short. So the internal teachers, on the other hand, gave feedback for different reasons. During observation, these teachers tended, to move, tended not to move around the classroom, but stationed themselves in the front of the class with movement restricted to the front section of the classroom. These teachers seem more focused on completing the lesson of the day rather than students participating and understanding the lesson. They seem to give feedback via the marking of assignments and classroom. And in case you're wondering how much time should you visit the classroom, over five times I visit the same classroom. Right? So, right. Um, so, where am I? Okay, sorry. Okay. So, I'm just trying to move ahead quickly. So, we come to the next theme, classroom behavior and discipline. Classroom behavior and discipline was defined as teachers perceiving that they are responsible for the creation of a comfortable and productive learning environment. Internals, when internals were asked using a TLOC instrument, if the students in the class became disruptive and noisy, when you leave them alone in the classroom for five minutes, this would be because, A, I didn't leave them interesting work to do while 
I was gone. B, the students are more noisy that day than they usually are, and C, other. Of course, the internals responded A. The internals were of the opinion that while students were equipped, the, sorry, the internals were of the opinion that when students are occupied, they are less likely to be disruptive. Internals seem to believe that teachers were responsible for communicating, for communicating to the students their standards and expectations of the class. Internals also recognized that if teacher left work that was above or below the students' academic understanding, their behavior below, the below their academic understanding, then misbehavior and disruption will ensue. And you can note that in the excerpts. Now we come to the external. Externals tended to take little responsibility for students' outcomes, especially their behavior. They did not see themselves as directly responsible for planning, managing, and developing acceptable classroom discipline among students. External 73 believe that if students really decide to misbehave, Badly, there is nothing that can be done. Now we come to Article 2. The findings from Article 1 was further augmented by the research reported in Article 2. And you see the details there. As, a, as the researcher, I was aware of each teacher's locus of control orientation, and the group of students were linked to specific teacher's locus of control orientation. I had several results from this study, but I'll just share one critical one. From the student's perspective, teachers with external locus of control express higher levels of negative comments in the classroom. And so discussion of these findings. Educators next to parents are the most influential to students. As such, they become role model and significant others in the student's life. Therefore, one of the goals should be to prepare teachers to take responsibility for outcomes in the classroom. We do this by helping teachers understand themselves and their psychological patterns, by administering psychological instruments to teachers and assisting them in understanding the outcomes of the instrument. I believe that at the core of the reflective practitioner is first an understanding of self. And as mentioned earlier, Reflection becomes not a surface reflection, but involves higher level cognitive functioning, such as self-awareness and meta-processes, such as metacognition. And what is metacognition? You figure it out, you're good students. It is clear from the quantitative and qualitative results that teachers' locus of control orientation predisposes teachers to have particular intentions that eventually influence their teaching practice. The internal teacher was holistic in her approach in feedback from students. Such feedback included verbal and nonverbal feedback. Nonverbal communication, just as I'm seeing it here, nonverbal communication is critical to enriching teacher's assessment of students' understanding during the teaching of a lesson. Therefore, teacher trainers could explore the possibility of offering a course on nonverbal communication. Webb et al. noted that a teacher's ability to decode nonverbal behavior, particularly that which communicates lack of comprehension of instruction is an important skill 
for teachers to develop. So we're going to move on to the third article. I don't think it's finished yet, you know. We still have one question to go. <laughs> so relax. So, um, so the third article, Teachers Locus of Control Scale, Test Characteristics and New Direction. The original Teachers Locus of Control Scale consisted of 25 forced choice items. We adapted this instrument and we modified the instrument by adding scoring scales. So teachers were no longer selecting just a or B. Teachers were now giving a weighting to show the strength of their commitment to each statement selected and to make the measurement more culturally adapted to the Jamaican high school teachers. So using latent cluster analysis, which is a statistical technique, allows for the clustering of the participants into groups. It was possible to identify three clusters of teachers. The three clusters were biased towards externality. The weighted score allowed me to refine the concept teacher's locus of control by allowing for the identification of three, exter three degrees of externality, high, moderate, and low. Sorry. So this has implications for professional development programs for teachers. Apart from using the scale to identify teachers who are external in their TLOC, teachers' locus of control, and the, the modified scale can be used to determine the length of time for professional development of teachers in various clusters. For example, teachers in cluster two who are high in external TLOC may need a longer time in a professional development program for change to occur compared to those in cluster three who are low in their external TLOC. And so we come to the final question. I know you'll wake up some of you. <laughs> it's coming down. How do teachers views on classroom management change in light of their understanding of differences in children's temperament. So using teachers' locus of control, I have shown that teachers' actions create or foster suitable or unsuitable learning environments. These different teaching learning environment are determined by teachers' decisions which are influenced by teachers' belief system. By extension, teachers will also differ in relation to what, stu to what students' behavior they value and will tolerate. And the students' behavior that they have little or no tolerance for. You get the picture? Okay. A child's response to a teacher will depend not only on the behavior and attitude of the teacher, but also on the behavioral characteristics of the children. Children with different behavioral char characteristics may evoke, may evoke different response from the same teacher. Teachers not only have to understand themselves, but they must also understand the children in their classroom. Hence, I'm looking at temperament at the early childhood level, using specifically reports from our intervention using the Insights into Children's Temperament program that was developed by Sandy McClory from New York University. So several authors agree that teachers are likely to be accepting of the difference in children's behavior if they, the teacher, acquired knowledge and understanding about children's characteristics, children's temperament. 
Hence, teachers' judgment, we expect, with such knowledge and understanding, will be less distorted, and they will make greater efforts to adjust their teaching and classroom management strategies, not to their needs, but to the needs of the children. Temperament is a child's consistent behavior pattern across various settings and situations. Through temperament, children interact and view the world. Temperament influences how people respond to others. They are contributing to their development. Yeah? My temperament influences how you all respond to me in different ways. So there are several theories on temperament and, the envir and children's environment. And I think Dr. Rainford mentioned the goodness of fit. So I won't get into it again, right? Just, just suffice to say, it refers to the extent to which the features in the environment matches the child's temperament. And that feature is not learning aids. The features are teachers' values, teachers' own personality, teachers' expectations. Those are the features of the environment. On the other hand, we do have poorness of fit. And this conflicts with a child's temperament and the demands and expectations of others. So when you hear about disruptive behavior, it's not necessarily that the child is evil and rude. There is a conflict between the teacher's temperament and the child's temperament. So the program Insights into Children's Temperament was implemented in January 2013. It is important to note that preliminary workshops, on, um, workshops were conducted in 2012. These workshops were, were intended to present the content of the intervention to Jamaican education leaders and practitioners. And just to give you a feedback, from the leaders and practitioners about insights as reported by McClory and Spellman. And I just quickly, insights give, give Jamaican educators and parents new options to, option, sorry, to replace harsh discipline. Insights give teachers and parents new perspective providing more development, appropriate and sophisticated ways of seeing things and so on and so forth. So McClory spent, we're winding down, okay. McClory spent 21 years studying children's temperament. She identified four temperamental profiles. Each of these profiles are represented by puppets. So we have Frederico the friendly. Doesn't he look friendly and happy? Oh yes, but we have to be careful with Frederico. Frederica has a safety problem. Frederica will go to any stranger, and when you take Frederica out on field trips, oh my God, he wanders. So when you're having field trips, you have to have extra eyes for Frederico. And the behavioral management strategies that teachers use by letting children stand outside the door may not work <laughs> for Frederica because he is friendly <laughs> and he enjoys seeing children and people and he enjoys giving his little smiles and extending warmth to passers-by. So these children may be disruptive just to get outside. <laughs> now we come to Coretta the cautious. Coretta is shy and withdrawn. Shy children can represent challenges to teachers aiming at inclusive classroom. They are the children that teachers tend to overlook. You know why? Because they're quiet. But they are the children who need the attention and support of teachers. They need teachers to scaffold, support them, and then to stretch them and stretch them. Right? And I have a girlfriend, I have to mention her, Ingrid Hunt-Anderson. She's forever telling me she's shy. 
Shy what? She has learned to manage that shyness. Right? So children can learn to manage their shyness. Now we come to Hillary, the hard worker, and children whose temperament profile, I love the laughter. <laughs> Children whose temperament profile is industrious are hard workers. They are low in negative reactivity and they are usually pleasant. They do not react when there, is, when there are changes of change in your plans. These children handle disappointment well. They will sit long hours and do their work. You hear some parents boasting, but I don't have no, no trouble with my child. I just give her the work, and she just sit and do it. And another one, Lord have mercy. Mine, every minute is up. Different personality. Hillary, however, needs help usually with being assertive. Now we come to the bombshell. Gregory the Grumpy. High in negative reactivity, low in task persistence, and high in activity. He is not ADHD, and he is not autistic. Children with high maintenance temperament react strongly and negatively to change or stressful situation. Because they're high in negative reactivity, they get upset easily and can be very moody. You ever hear teachers say, I have an attitude, is them, right? On the positive side, the high activity level of the high maintenance child can energize others. They're leaders, so teachers have to be careful how they suppress them. In addition, High maintenance children are often comfortable making decisions, expressing their opinions, even when others disagree. In other words, they are assertive. The optimal teacher's response for a child high in negative reactivity is not to escalate the situation by reacting in an intense and negative way. What teachers do, the mistake they do, is to engage with the child. Let go of the child, let the child calm down, right? A parent shared with me that she has, her child is high in negative reactivity and after she did the, class, the sessions with us for eight weeks, um, she had that experience. She normally argues with him when she's telling him, we're not doing this again and she's trying, trying to let him understand but he's not understanding a thing. So what she did after coming through our sessions she just let him go. She just explained, and he's whining and crying, and she left him alone. She said she could not believe it. After half an hour, she did, she, the child was back to normal. So, so now I will share with you, we, um, I think Michelle mentioned that we have insights reached 3,560 children, 193 parents, and 112 teachers. I will now report, and it's a very short, trust me. I will now report on how teachers viewed insights program. Teachers prior to participating in insights intervention viewed students' disruptive behavior as rude, annoying, and downright out of order. Oh, by the way, these are early childhood. These are not secondary. All right, so, so teachers' expectations for children's behavior at the early childhood level did not align with their development level. The teachers' comments emerged from focus group discussions, and we target all 112 teachers. And just to give you an example, I thought that these children were done right out of order, early childhood. They don't know how to behave. Of course they don't know how to behave. They're children. I thought that they were lazy and needed to go back to basic school. This is at the primary level. 
or stay home with their parents, better still. I just thought that they were rude and who didn't know and they didn't know how to sit still. Which children, which child sits still? And, and so forth. It was also evident that teachers encountered difficulties in dealing with shy students. Teachers admit to ignoring shy children because they are not talkers and they are not, they the teachers are not equipped to interact with them. And you see the excerpts there. You can't help because they're not talking. These are early childhood, you know, they're not talking. You don't know how to deal with them. Okay. So here comes insights. We did our intervention, and I will just quickly, trust me, I'm near the end. I will just quickly report on the results following the intervention. So, all teachers felt that the information was useful in different degrees. Most of the teachers felt that the information was very useful or extremely useful. Here are the examples of qualitative results from the teachers after the intervention. I knew of them referring to temperament, but the way they were categorized and the way they were highlighted helped me to better understand and identify them. And therefore, I'm, I have a better concept of what to expect from what kind of child and how to be best achieve their ultimate learning outcome. One last one and the other one you can read on your own. Excited? I have learned a lot. It has opened my eyes to children's temperament and why they behave in certain ways and how, how I am to react to them. And so, so that it doesn't come out negative. And to help them also to understand and to make them know how to behave. And then you, see, you have the other. So the program help teachers to reframe, the, to reframe how they perceive children's behavior. For example, most children are not rude and evil. They are little babies. But there are challenges with every temperament, even always as adults. These challenges must be managed. Hence, children need to be taught by adults and trained by adults how to control the challenging side of their temperament. The poor children are wondering, why am I behaving so badly? I can't figure it out. Right? So now, happily, we're at the closing comments. One page. <laughs> the call for teachers. The call is for teachers to better understand themselves, how their differences impact the classroom, and how those differences interact with children's differences. Of course, this involves teacher training institutions administering various instruments to help teachers in training to understand their own life history and how their experiences and beliefs will influence interactions in the classroom. In so doing, those teachers who are disposed to using verbal abuse as a tool for behavioral management will be able to understand themselves early in their career and how their experiences with harsh disciplinary strategies as children dispose them to use the same disciplinary strategies as adults towards children who they are now responsible for in the classroom. The principles of insights into children's temperament challenges the educational system to embrace children differences in their temperament that are manifested by their behavior and to reframe teachers' role in the classroom. Training should help teachers to recognize the source of harsh behavioral management strategies and help them to change their mindset. 
And so the role of the teachers, especially at the early childhood level, is more to train children in how to manage their challenges while establishing healthy boundaries through behavioral management strategies, such as taking away privilege or time out. Teachers need to see their role as training children to manage the challenging aspects of their temperament while celebrating the end of this, this lecture. No, while celebrating <laughs> a child's unique characteristics. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. You have been excellent. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.